Welcome back to the second part of the containers lecture this afternoon. In the first part, we have seen a general introduction to the concepts of containers, of images, and we have seen how to use Docker in order to, to work with the images, to work with containers, and how to containerize applications with some HPC-specific examples like MPI and GPUs. Now, in this second part, we, uh, we will see uh, how uh, we will have a closer look at a container run at a container engine specifically meant for HPC and what it means to apply containers to HPC using the Sarus container engine. So uh, second part will be sorry for that. Probably you can hear some road noises. Uh, this second part will be structured very sim similarly to the first part. I will present some slides, providing an introduction, and then I will uh, show uh, a live demo, demo of the of the Cyrus Container Engine on a high performance system. Uh, the slides are always available at the same repository, at the same GitHub repository, uh, but there uh, there is no uh, there are no exercises um, for the virtual lab because it would have uh, yeah it would have been we would have liked to welcome you all on 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 a high performance system but it was become due to the high number of participants it was becoming complicated to to manage so um, in the first part of the lecture we talked about docker how it is uh, extremely popular as a con as a container implementation it can do a lot of things it's uh, it's used uh, on a lot of systems by a lot of organizations so it should be usable also for HPC right actually we would like to use the same solutions we learn things only once and we use it everywhere um, Unfortunately, that is not the case. Docker and HPC are not a good fit for several reasons. The first one is that the security model adopted by Docker assumes root privileges. So Docker was created for implementing DevOps workflows. That would be infrastructure as code. And that and it is meant to be executed by root. In fact, if you can use if you can use Docker on any machine, it means that you have super user privileges because those are required to connect between the Docker client and the daemon that's uh, under the hood. And this is something that is not applicable. Given this kind of privileges is something that is not applicable to HPC systems, which by nature are uh, very uh, systems that are used at the same time uh, by concurrently by many users. So that uh, giving uh, super user and super user privileges to that many users is a concern for H is an understandable concerns for HPC operators and HPC providers. Secondly, uh, Docker has problems in integrating with workload managers, which are used ubiquitously on high performance systems. Docker also does not support diskless nodes because uh, it requires images to be available locally uh, on the same node or on the same system which will spawn a container. And this is not the case for several high performance clusters where, 
where no where the single compute nodes are frequently diskless so they just have let's say a ram disk with a basic operating system but then all the other resources are mounted by par by parallel file systems they're not part of the node itself uh, Docker also has very limited support for the so, uh, kernel bypassing devices. Uh, so to make concrete examples, accelerators, uh, we have seen uh, and uh, network interface cards. We have seen that Docker has introduced in its latest version support for NVIDIA GPUs, but regarding all um, many of the other specialized hardware, uh, used by uh, high performance machines that's uh, that's not the case and finally docker uh, has no doesn't adopt a storage driver that is adequate for parallel file systems so with a storage driver I mean the software component that manages how the image is mounted inside the container from a storage point of view the the, the defaults you the, the options available by docker do not work well with parallel file systems from a performance point of view so for these for uh, so for these reasons uh, um, the hpc community has come uh, has developed the, the hpc specific container runtimes or container engine. So container software that was able to run uh, images, um, but in a way that fit the needs for, uh, to fit the needs and the practices of the high performance computing community. And one of these, one of these so, uh, solutions, HPC solutions is called Sarus. Cyrus is an OCI compatible container engine. So OCI is the industry standards set forth by the uh, Open Containers Initiative. That's a short end. And has been engineered and developed by CSCS, the Swiss National Supercomputing Center. Cyrus is designed for, as I mentioned, for the requirements of HPC, for example, in prioritizing performance from specific hardware, uh, ensuring security, uh, also in the in regards of the access permissions granted by users. So um, making sure that in a multi-tenant machine, the file access permissions are enforced also in shared file systems and stuff like that. Uh, it presents a consistent user experience with Docker, so the learning curve is small for people for people that want to uh, to use it and already know Docker, which is a fairly safe assumption uh, when people are working with containers. Cyrus enables uh, transparent performance from native hardware through hooks, which are basically plugins. They are standalone programs which can extend the basic capabilities of the runtime. And given that it is being designed based on open standards, it is able to uh, use upstream component, upstream uh, software components on HPC systems. Like for example, it is able to reuse some of the internal components of Docker, uh, which also come from the open source community. And the, the, the adoption of an extensible architecture uh, reduces the maintenance effort and also encourages vendors uh, creating proprietary technologies to uh, come up with their own extensions that can be integrated into, into this main container engine to allow uh, the use of custom hardware and software solutions. Um, as I said, Cyrus has been designed to integrate seamlessly with the workflows proposed by Docker. So what we are seeing typically at CSCS is uh, that the user take this 
trajectory, let's say, to get to get containers to run into the systems, the first two steps are uh, are this are always the same as with Docker and images created with from a Docker file in a in a, in a computer like it would be a, a laptop or another personal workstation. It is pushed to the to the cloud, likely to the Docker Hub registry. And then Cyrus can be can be used to communicate with Docker Hub, retrieve the uh, retrieve the image from Docker Hub and save it into the storage systems at the HPC center and then run at scale on the high performance computing cluster. So something that would, would feel familiar to a Docker user already. Um, from a user perspective, Cyrus offers a consistent experience with Docker and, uh, be, and because it adopts a closely resembling command line interface and also with the host environments where the identity of the user and file permissions and environment variables are preserved uh, within the container. Cyrus is able to pull in, as I mentioned, to pull images from Docker registries like Docker Hub of the NVIDIA GPU cloud or if some user is not comfortable in uploading the images to the cloud uh, or to a public registry, it also gives the possibility to import images from TAR archives. So um, you just are sync the TAR archive uh, that can be created with Docker. Docker has the possibility to convert an image into a TAR archive. So you are seeing this archive over to the, the, uh, the computing cluster and Cyrus can just create an image from this archive. Cyrus integrates naturally with the with workload managers such as Lerm because it's, a, it's based on a daemonless architecture and is able to extract native performance from the GPUs and high-speed interconnects that are present in HPC systems and also to grant access to parallel file systems inside containers. Uh, this is just an example. I mentioned that the CLI of Saros is very close with the one from Docker and this is an example. Uh, this should give you an idea. Uh, as you can see, it is quite close. We, we have the pull command to retrieve images, load to load tar files, images to list the images, RMI to remove images, and Cyrus run instead of done. Um, so yeah, the, so that's the theoretical introduction that's what's written on the on the label let's let's go into a live demo to see how we can run containers on an hpc system and what an hpc specific container engine can do for us so a quick word about the host for the demo i will be running on pitsdient which is the flagship system for the Swiss National HPC service installed at CSCS in Lugano in southern Switzerland. It is currently the number 10 in the, the June 2020 top 500 list of fastest supercomputers in the world. It is an hybrid Cray XC40, XC50 supercomputers with uh, 5,700 of hybrid nodes featuring an, a Z, an Intel Xeon processor and an NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPU. And a little bit more than 1800 multi-core nodes with dual Intel Xeon processors. The interconnect is the Cray, Cray Arius high-speed interconnect, so proprietary technology from Cray, and the operating system is the Cray Linux environment. So a very, very specialized, very custom 
system. Uh, let me get into my session, uh, my terminal. And okay, here we are on Pitsdined. We're one in one of the login nodes. I have already obtained a reservation and an allocation, rather. So, as you can see, I have two nodes for the next couple of hours, should be plenty of time. So now we can just, first thing I need to do is to load the module with Sarus. And now we have access. We see we're running version 110. So what is the first thing that we did with Docker? We pulled an image from the cloud and run it uh, in order to run it into a container. So with Sarus, we can do the same thing, but the, uh, I have to request one node to the workload manager. If you're not familiar with this syntax, uh, Pitsdient uses the Slurm workload manager. It's an open source uh, workload, man uh, workload manager. It's quite it's quite popular. So srun is the way to run commands uh, inside the allocated compute nodes. So I am using one. I'm requesting one node. From here, I can do sarus pull. And as an image, I let's choose the my script image that we worked on the first part of the lecture. So from I use my user, then my script, and the tag. So Cyrus is now contacting Docker Hub. It is downloading the layers and converting them. And now the pull process is complete. Well, how do we check the image is available on the system? Well, as we add with Docker, we also have Sarus images. And you can see I have quite quite a few images here. Maybe with I reduce the font just to be a little bit more readable, uh, just to fit them all on the screen. And we can see that at the bottom here, there is my the my script image that I pulled just right now. So now we now that we have an image, we run we run a container, right? We always request to the workload manager do Sarus now run and the image identifier. And then let's just execute the script right away, as we did before with Docker. And my script runs out of the box. Contents of the slash app directory, check wget is installed, it's here, and the environment variable name is is my own name, is Alberto. So, as you can, the same. So, as you can see, we just run on one of the most powerful computers in Europe. Something that I created a little while ago on my laptop. The same, the same software, same image, run on a laptop and on a supercomputer, like in a, in a matter of seconds. This is one of the. Uh, this is one of the, uh, this should give you the idea of what the potential of containers should be when applied to HPC. 
Um, okay, now uh, now with with Docker, we have also we have also seen how to create how to open an interactive shell inside a container. Saros is also able to do that. We do it with for, uh, we do it with srun. Now I also have to ask a PTY from the workload manager because we have to connect all the different all the, all the pipes all throughout from the container all the way to the to my terminal. Do sarus run minus t to request also sarus to open a terminal. Uh, my script and then let's open a bash so as you can see we, we need two options here one for the container engine and one for the workload manager in order to have the the pipes for the terminal getting from inside the container all the way to my terminal this is one more step than just the minus it the dash it with with docker Once we do it, here we are. We are inside the container. And you can tell we are inside the container because the app subdirectory is here oh, with the script inside. And one thing that you may have noticed is that I'm inside the container, but I have remained my own user. This is, a, this is opposed uh, to uh, not oppose, but this is different from what Docker does in uh, transforming you into the root user. Like uh, Sarus, like the other HPC specific container container runtimes, uh, uh, is very careful on giving you on the identity and permissions that you actually have on the on the host system. In order that when you access share, uh, when you access shared resources like shared file systems, parallel file systems, you're not able to tamper around with other user stuff, and of course other people cannot tamper around with your uh, with your files. So this kind of um, uh, this kind of enforcing of permissions is something that is looked uh, is looked at very closely by these um, HPC container implementations. Um, and just if you want to be sure, you can just print the informations about the, the operating system. And I, it seems that I am running Debian on, in this session. While uh, this is clearly happens inside the container, but I have I am always using the Linux distribution that I have chosen with the software stack that I have chosen, and we can see that this is indeed the case because if I exit and ask a compute node to print the information about its operating system, we see that it's based on SUSE Linux enterprise server. So something, again, very different from the software stack that we are able to reproduce consistently into the container. Uh, OK, I, I mentioned several times about uh, accessing uh, uh, parallel file systems uh, uh, from containers. Uh, because this is indeed a very important uh, use case, a very important feature to have when operating on supercomputers. Because the, um, um, the data is not present in is not present in the nodes, but there is usually a hierarchy of different file systems con all connected to um, all connected to the compute nodes 
we might have. And these file systems vary in performance, they vary in available space, they vary in quotas. So it, it is important to be able to access these, diff these different parallel file systems from containers in order to carry out useful job. For example, here on Pitsdyne, the Scratch file system is a, a Luster-based file system, which is meant to have very, um, very high performance, but short-lived data retention, and is meant to host the working data for the applications. So, uh, where the input data is staged in order to be ingested by running simulations and also where uh, and scratch is also where the output results from the running programs is um, is staged before being transferred over to more long-term storage supports so if if the usual workflow yes 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 here requires me to have data on scratch in order to be used by the applications how do i expose this scratch file system to my containers uh, and in order to to check that i'm going to create a file here on my on my current directory and uh, i say hello from hello from the host and I save it on hello.txt. Now I run from the workload manager. Let's let's do it in an interactive way again. Cyrus run t, and then I can use the minus minus mount option to request a file system mount from a location that I have access to on the host and into the container. You have to specify the type of mount. In this case, it's a bind mount. I have to uh, I have to specify the source, the source path for the mount, and then the destination or the location where I want it to be exposed inside the container. And the Scratch, the Scratch uh, SNX 3000 seems like good because we're not going to be hiding anything that's uh, that's already in the image, so it's fine. Then, once again, the image identifier and and we request a bash terminal. Okay, let's have a look. We are inside the container and we see that Scratch is now available inside the container. I can go inside it. And this is my working directory for the summer school. Oh, sorry. And the hello script is here and I can read it just fine. And we are inside the container, but we receive a message from the host. How nice of them. So the minus minus mount option to Cyrus run is the way you can expose uh, other file systems inside containers and get uh, data in and out of the containers because Sarus differently from Docker will dispose of the container once it has executed uh, the requested command. Contain Sarus containers will be destroyed right away. So it's very important for an application like a scientific simulation to be able to save the data to um, a persistent location. Okay, um, now uh, we have seen how to perform some uh, basic stuff like re retrieving images, running containers, 
expo uh, interactive sessions. Uh, but now let's see what's the um, uh, what's the defining feature of an HPC container runtime mean from the point of view of performance? What can these HPC specific container solutions like Sarus give us in terms of uh, in terms of performance from these very specific machines like Pits Dined? So I will once again I will propose an example with NVIDIA GPUs because we, we have seen that uh, Pitts Dynt is outfitted with those, and high performance MPI. Uh, first, uh, let's get on with the, with the GPU example. I will be reusing the same CUDA samples image that I have used, I've used in the first part of the lecture, and which run on my laptop. Uh, so I believe I already uh, I have already done with the image here. Whoops, Sarus images. Yes, the CUDA samples 10.0 is already available in in the system, so I can just run it with. S run one so first run so uh, differently from Docker, Sarus on this system is already configured to automatically import GPUs if we are running on um, if you're running on the GPU partition of Pits Dined, which we are, because I requested GPU nodes from the uh, from the workload manager when performing the allocation. So Sarus is able to work in tandem with the workload manager to identify the presence of GPUs and doesn't require any specific action from, from the end user in order to enable them inside the container. So let's check that this is the case with the device query sample. Utilities. And here it is. The device query ran successfully. The Tesla P100 has been detected with its 16 gigabytes of RAM, 3,500 CUDA cores, and all of, all of its niceties. It's available, ready, and awaiting our commands. From our container commands, rather. <laughs> I would have to say. So let's let's now run also the end body simulation, which gave which gave us a like a performance indication, a performance reference rather, as we have done with the uh, on the laptop simulations and body. Again, benchmark mode in double precision, but this time we are, I'm going to request 200,000, so a little bit more than the 5,000 that I asked to my to my laptop, because these GPUs are big boys; they can take that. It takes a little bit of time. And here it is, the simulation is completed and it has achieved 3000 gigaflops per second with 100, 103 billion interactions per second. So compare this number, if you remember on my laptop, this same program achieved 11 
double precision gigaflops. So like we are about 300 times faster on this system. The same image, the same software that runs on, on a laptop, it runs seamlessly on a laptop and on a supercomputer, and it's able to leverage to the fullest the performance of each platform. And just like that, it, it goes 300 times faster. But I just had to pull the image and run the container. Nothing specific, n n nothing specific, just to tune the performance. Um, okay, this is uh, regarding GPU. We have seen that Cyrus can enable full performance. Let's talk a little bit about MPI now. Uh, so, uh, this time I will not be using the Hello World MPI from the first part of the lecture. I'll be using uh, a different image, which will give, uh, which again uh, gives us an indication of the performance that we're able to extract from, from the system. And the image is, has been created with this Docker file here. Uh, once again, I base on Debian. I install some compilation tools. I once again install mpitch in version 3.14. And on top of it, I build the OZU micro benchmarks. The OZU micro benchmarks uh, are a collection of utilities and small programs to evaluate the performance of uh, of, MP of interconnects and computer networks using MPI. And a they can also be used to compare different MPI implementations between them. Um, okay, so Let's, let's, uh, I have already built and pulled this image um, uh, on Pitsdient. Uh, I can show you images wrap to page 314. And here it is. I actually have two variants, uh, but this is the image I will be using the OZO micro benchmarks with 532 with MPH 314. So how do we run an MPI software uh, at full performance with Cyrus? This time we request two nodes from the workload manager. And Cyrus run we add the minus minus MPI option, and I will explain it in a little bit. We enter the image identifier, also micro benchmark, and then we will be executing the OZU latency, the OZU latency test. This is basically a peer to peer test which performs a ping pong communication between two nodes and will print out what's what's the latency between these tests. Um, okay, so uh, I said that I would explain a little bit what the MPI option from Sarus means. So the minus minus MPI option from Sarus activates what's called the native MPI support, meaning that uh, an MPI library, an MPI stack, uh, sorry, an MPI libraries from the host, which are config, which are indicated by the system administrators, will be 
injected into the container and will replace the MPI libraries inside the container. Why this is needed? This is needed because, as we saw on this particular system, the network is, is a Cray area interconnect. Cray areas is a proprietary product from Cray. And thus, the full performance of this network can only be achieved with the MPI libraries provided by Cray, provided by the vendor itself. So this replacement mechanism is, um, is meant to expose the, uh, to bring the vendor specific MPI libraries inside the container image and, that, and thus expose the full performance of the network to the container. This is possible because the Cray MPI and MPitch are, uh, are compatible between them, not just because M Cray MPI is based on, on, the, on MPitch, but because the both are ABI, ABI compatible. That means that the application binary interface is, uh, is compatible between them. So ABI, uh, as I said, stands for application binary interface. In simpler terms, this means that the dynamic linker can link to either of the two libraries and still be able to make the application work at link time. Um, but anyway, in any way, we know that on this system, Cyrus has been uh, configured. We know that Cray MPI and MPitch are compatible, but in any way, Cyrus will check that libraries from the host systems and libraries in the image are compatible enough and it's safe to perform this replacement. So let's have a look and run it. Oh, did I make some mistake? Yes, I made a typo. I added a dot where it shouldn't be there. Okay, so the latency test runs and we see that we achieve around one microsecond of latency on several message sizes, topping out at 444 microseconds for the biggest message size. Fair enough, but how do we know that we are actually using the full performance of the areas interconnect? Well, we can verify what happens if we try to run with the MPI implementation just provided by the by the container image, plain and simple. In order to do that, minus two, uh, I actually can just reuse the same command. So let's remove the minus minus MPI, the minus minus MPI command uh, option to Cyrus run, but we have to add an option to the workload manager instead, which is minus minus MPI PMI2. Uh, why do I need to do this? Well, because the, uh, the MPI launcher that is managed by the workload manager here has to be able to communicate, of course, with the MPI libraries inside the ranks, inside the MPI ranks, which will be the containers, okay? But on this specific system, on Pitsdient, since, as I said, it, it's a Cray system meant to be used with a Cray, uh, the, which by default uses the Cray MPI, by default, the, the workload manager will use an interface to communicate between the MPI launcher and the MPI processes, it will use uh, an interface called the Cray PMI, the Cray Process Management Interface, which, which is not recognized by 
the ba the plain M pitch that we have compiled inside our images. So in order to go around this, this minus minus MPI equals PMI2 option to the workload manager is saying to the workload to the workload manager, please do not give me the Cray PMI, give me PMI2, which is a standard, which is a standard uh, process management interface, which is understood by MPitch. And actually, it is also the default uh, communication interface used by the MPitch uh, MPI libraries. So with this setup, we, uh, we should be able to run the same latency benchmark, but just using the MPI that comes from the image. Let's see how it goes. So the program is has run successfully again, but we see that the numbers are a little bit different. From one, we are up to seven microseconds, and at the end of the highest message sizes, we have more than doubled in latency. So this quick example gives you an idea of how an HPC specific container solution like Sarus can re, uh, put a focus on extracting uh, on uh, extracting the most from specialized hardware and combining the 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 two uh, combining the portability of containers with the performance of HPC uh, infrastructures. Uh, because the, the power of the native MPI support of Sarus that is activated with the minus minus MPI option, with the minus minus MPI switch, is that uh, the replacement mechanism enacted ta starts from a portable image, an image created with off the shelf software. Uh, I'm sorry if you can hear you. Uh, maybe you can hear some background noises. There is a church bell uh, <laughs> sounding. I'm, I'm sorry if it gets picked up by the microphone. So I was saying uh, this uh, this, this native MPI support by Cyrus is able to take an, uh, a portable image with off-the-shelf software, basic software that's commonly available and runs in many different systems, taking a portable images and at runtime create from this image a, a container which performs at native uh, speed. So the, this is, the, these are the capabilities uh, uh, and, and these are the advantages of using HPC specific software and HPC specific container engines. Um, okay, so this is basically everything that I wanted to show you on on Pitsdyne. So let me get back these lights. Uh, oh. So if you if I if you are curious about Cyrus, uh, you can check the full user documentation. It's available. Read the docs, and the code is available on GitHub at the repository hosted by CSCS and ETH Zurich. And once again, um, I remind you that. Uh, these slides and the material for the virtual lab are available on GitHub. The lab intro video is on YouTube, and this and this is my contact email. Should you wish to uh, get in touch with me after the school, uh, so 
let's uh, this is a slide that remembers us that the school was made possible by easy ways and which received funding from the European Union so we are very grateful for that and this basically concludes my my presentation my lesson and i will be very happy to go over your questions and answer as many as 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 i can basically so i see a question from uh, from julian how is the container data and image efficiently distributed among the nodes where I run the jobs? Um, so the um, um, Sarus uses an approach which is also uh, very similar to what uh, shift uh, to uh, to what other HPC container engines use, um, like Shifter, for example. It uh, it is based on um, on uh, on a loop mount. If you know the details of the uh, of the terminology, on a loop on loop mounting uh, a SquashFS file. So what the what this technique allows you to do is that you mount a, a single file which contain which uh, contains a, a file system in itself and what this does it, it plays upon the strengths of the parallel file systems because since basically all the nodes uh, the, the container file system in all the nodes really all goes back to the same uh, file on both file systems because usually the the images are hosted on parallel file on the parallel file systems which are where the space is available on HPC provider on HPC um, sites right so um, if all the containers hit uh, make requests uh, to the files inside the image, they all really hit the same file on the back on on the back end of the parallel file system, and this helps the the parallel file system to efficiently cache all uh, these uh, all these requests and be very efficient at it. Um, and this contrasts with the um, with the strategy used by Docker that always uh, separates the images in many different files uh, while Sarus and um, flattens the images when they are uh, pulled into the system they are flattened into a single file and so to avoid to thrash the parallel file system when um, by asking asking you to read files all over the place because they are segmented in between all the different image layers um, did i explain myself somewhat clearly julian that, that's some some explains so basically uh, the image is flattened into a single file it is not kept in different layers and then that same file is loop mounted from the from the parallel file system so this way it is redistributed very quickly across all the nodes and they all read the same file to leverage caching, file system caching. Um, I see a question from uh, Milena. Can I please upload the file for the MPI application? Uh, okay, yeah, I think that's not available, but uh, I can surely do that. We'll do that after the after the lecture. If you are curious about using it as a reference, um, uh, there is a question from 
Woj, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can pronounce the name correctly. Wojciech, uh, could I, could, if I, could you comment on how Cyrus compares to Singularity or Charlie Cloud? Uh, okay, it's kind of a tricky question. So, uh, compared to um, Compared to Charlie Cloud, I would say they um, they have a different philosophy. So Charlie Cloud means to be a very uh, simple, very minimal tool, uh, and to run unprivileged containers for the sake of security. Um, but this also, but but given that is a, it has a very very strong emphasis on being as minimal as possible and as small as possible, uh, so, um, the user experience with Charlie Cloud um, requires, um, uh, requires uh, a bit of knowledge and a bit of uh, proficiency, let's say, from the user to know um, uh, to know what's going on and what needs to be done with with a with a, with a given container is a much more it's a much more essential and bare bone user experience. Uh, I have um, and I haven't looked in Charlie Cloud from some time, but for example, I remember the like um, some time ago the. Um, uh, the, the um, you would not with Charlie Cloud you would not get uh, uh, an image management as clear as with Docker or with Saros that you could for example probe which images are available on the system and uh, and know uh, what you can do and what you uh, which are available and which not um, because with Charlie Cloud you just Import a tar file and expand the tar files into into directories. So um, there 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 are solutions with different fo focus. Um, compared to Singularity, um, uh, I would say the things that uh, that differentiates Sarus from Singularity is that Singularity. Um, um, and or rather, let's take it the other way around. Saros is designed to leverage uh, and to integrate with uh, industry standards set by uh, the the community. So, it, as I said, it it adopts an extensible architecture um, and a modular architecture enabled by these standards. So, it is able to reuse. Uh, in to reuse some of the components that also work inside docker and to also use the the extensions created for docker uh, very very easily so for example the gpu support from sarus uh, is made possible the native G nvidia gpu support in sarus is made possible by the NVIDIA Container Toolkit, so the same piece of software that enables the same kind of support on Docker itself. Uh, Singularity uh, is different in this regard because it tries to uh, uh, kind of um, re, um, it's not meant to um, Integrate a lot with Docker. Yes, you can pull Docker images, uh, and you can, and um, you can convert Docker images to singular to the singularity format. But it's much more focused on supporting its own its own formats, its own technology, it, it, and and. Yeah, it, it moves. Uh, singularity moves on a direction of its own. Uh, let's say, of course, there there is still some baseline available, but the the difference there could be that 
uh, Sarus he looks more forward to what uh, doc, uh, to what are possibilities of integrating with Docker and other uh, and other uh, tools in the ecosystem. And Singularity is much more focused on supporting their own their own formats. Let's say. Um, I've seen uh, uh, there is a question from Danny. Can I install Sarus in my home directory on HPC, or should this be installed system-wide by administrators? Uh, Sarus is still. Uh, is there someone scribbling over the <laughs> the the screen? I swear it's not me. <laughs> that, that should not have happened because we are the only two that was supposed to have power to do that. OK. Julian so, is not here anymore. I'll, I'll double check if someone else has Let me see. Here. OK, I, ca I can, I can <laughs> raise that. No problem. Uh, so getting back to the getting back to your question. Um, so uh, Saru, uh, so Danny, uh, sorry about uh, about the delay. Uh, uh, Sarus is still uh, a privileged uh, solution, a privileged container solution, and thus it is meant to be installed by system administrators in order to correctly enforce the the permissions. Uh, but it is uh, if you want you can install it on uh, it it, work, it also works on nor on regular computers let's say on normal you can install it on your laptop uh, if you go to the to the github repository there is um, a, what we call a standalone archive so a statically linked a prepackaged version of sarus then there are there are instructions in the documentation to easily set it up starting from the from that archive so if you want to take it out for spin uh, there should be uh, a quick way to do so but for uh, deployment on hpc systems it should be done by a system administrator Okay, I do not see any more questions. So I, I, will, I will get it. Let me drink something, I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, so if nobody has any more questions, we thank you very, very much for the attention that you dedicated to me this afternoon. I hope uh, I, uh, you can take something from these lectures, from what I've shown you with containers, Docker, and the application of containers in HPC. And I really hope that you can start using these tools and these instruments to in, to in, in your daily workflows, if you see the potential in them, of course. And I will let you go over the uh, I will let you go over the virtual lab. And thank you very much again. Have a have a great evening. Thank you so much, Alberto. And uh, guys, uh, as Alberto mentioned, their lab is also there. So we have a pre-recording lab in containers for you to also play with. And then tomorrow, uh, he'll be back to answer some questions, some extra questions that you had about the lab. And we have a full day of questions for the labs and then uh, a keynote speaker in the afternoon. So I'll stop the recording now.